You're listening to Mr. Liverpool himself, Frank Carlisle, exclusively, exclusively on Mersey Radio. Well, what do you think of that, Mark? Absolutely superb. Caught in a trap. Yep. Elvis and John Lennon, probably yep. two of my favourites. Well, this is it. You know, you, you, you look at these two great artists, don't you? And we put a there yet. Um, you know, we'll be talking about Elvis and John. Even the likes of Stuart Sutcliffe. Now, his uh, particular paintings, as as uh, we'll be told, uh, uh, they range from 500 to 12,000 quid. And there's Stuart Sutcliffe, and he was only 21 when he died, Stuart Sutcliffe. And yeah, he was uh, one of the original members of the Beatles. He was the fifth Beatle. Mm. And that's a shame because at 21 years of age, just a baby, isn't it, really? You know, when you look at it. I've actually been into his house, you know. That's a hotel now. Beautiful house, you know. So he did come from a uh, very, we'd say today, a privileged background. Is that, is that in the South End, is it? Or? Yeah, it's in Sefton Park. Sefton Park. Sefton Park, beautiful. It's a, it's a hotel now. I gave a talk there. Someone asked me to go down and give a talk, which you did. And uh, that's how I got to see the, the inside of this particular place. They've got pictures of them, you know, uh, in and around uh, the hotel. Lots of Americans go there, as you can imagine, and Japanese and another uh, people. Lots of Germans, uh, you know, German tourists, you know, they, they come over for the Beatles thing and whatever. Anyway, we're going over to uh, Derek. Good evening, Derek. Hi, Frank. Hi, Mark. Evening, Good Derek. to speak to you again. Well, absolutely brilliant. And, you know, as I mentioned before, Mark, you know, the title is uh, More Famous After Death. You know, these uh, particular artists. What, what Mark and I were saying, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about artists, you know, painters, yeah. uh, how they became uh, famous after their deaths. The likes of Van Gogh is one of the better known uh, people. You know, his, his paintings are sold for millions now, and yet he couldn't even sell one while he was alive. So, who's your most famous person, you know? From the music business who died and all of a sudden, you know, they became famous afterwards. Well, I think, I mean, the two songs you just played, Elvis and John Lennon, I think there's yeah. a, a big argument to say that they, 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 uh, they've they grown in uh, stature since they, uh, they died. But I think if you want someone who uh, would have been completely unknown had it not been for other people recording his work later... Uh, you go a long way to beat Robert Johnson. Uh, he was one of the original blues guys. I mean, he died in 1938. He only ever recorded 29 songs. Yeah. Uh, and they include things like uh, Love in Vain, that the uh, the Stones covered on their Let It Bleed album. Yeah. And particularly Crossroads Blue, Crossroad Blues he wrote. Yeah. Uh, and that, of course, was made very famous by Eric Clapton and, uh, and Cream. And you and wouldn't he, think that, would you? You know, going back all those years. Absolutely. You wouldn't think that, you know, because as you said, he died in 1938. That's right. I mean, he reputedly sold his soul to the devil oh, uh, right. in exchange for guitar virtuoso You know, well, I've, heard so, I've heard something about that. I didn't know it was him, like Robert Johnson. Yeah. Did they sing a song? Uh, oh. I'm sure um, Johnny Cash... Did some sort of song, you know, where he sells yeah. a fiddle. Was it, a, you know, a fiddle? Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. S- selling a soul for the fiddle. I don't know. Some fiddler wanted to play the best fiddle ever on songs. Yeah. So I wonder if that was a take on it. It, it probably was. And he died at 27 as well. Um, I put him as the first member of the 27 Club because ah, of this yeah. uh, selling his soul to the devil. Ah, I mean, yeah. Some people sort of backtrack on that and find jazz musicians and people earlier than that who died at 27. But my take on that very much is that that whole legend comes about as a result of, of him and his pact with the uh, with the devil. He was killed by a jealous husband, apparently, all very rock and roll. Oh, right, OK. Well, uh, the devil went down to Georgia. That was the... Uh, that was the Charlie st- Daniels. Yeah. That was a Charlie Daniels band. Right. 
Absolutely brilliant, brilliant you know, because oh, I, I tell you the, uh, another thing, you know, just getting away from um, the music, because we'll be going back to that in a moment. Jimmy Dean, James Dean. Yeah. Nominee for the best actor in the leading role. And he, yeah, he got a posthumous actor nomination in the uh, in America's uh, Academy history. Rebel without a course. You know, absolutely amazing. And yes, yeah. he was one of the uh, the great actors. And he, what did they call The All-American boy, you know, with the attitude sort of. Sort well, it was, he invented a teenager almost. I mean, the teenager, right. the whole teenage angst thing, he really started right. with his second movie, Rebel Without a Cause. Yeah. yeah. And he was fascinating. He only ever um, made three movies, East of Eden, Rebel Without a Cause and Giant. Yeah. And um, both of those were, East of Eden and Rebel were both... Uh, nominated for various uh, things. James Dean, as you say, was nominated. In fact, the first posthumous uh, nomination in the Academy's history for uh, East of Eden. Uh, but a v- bunch of other people were nominated as well for uh, Rebel Without a Cause. But he yeah. got a second nomination for Giant. Yeah. Now, Giant considered to be a really good film, but it's a bit weird because um, I remember reading somewhere that uh, James Dean's part at the end of the film had to be um, overdubbed in uh, post production because he was mumbling uh, so much. Yeah. Do you mean he died his, mumbling his lines? Yeah. And someone that, couldn't understand them. But yeah. That's right. So in post production, they, they uh, overdubbed it because he, I mean, he was long dead by then. Uh, he, what, what happened was he'd taken up motor racing uh, and he was really into that, but the, uh, the producers wouldn't let him race. While he was making Giant, obviously the insurance would have been a bit of an issue. Yeah. Um, and as soon as he'd finished, he shot off to uh, California. Yeah. Uh, well, he was on his way to to uh, a race meeting in uh, Salinas, mm. uh, California, when he crashed. He wanted was- to. He, he, I don't know whether you're aware of this, but he wanted to Alec Guinness to go with him because Alec Guinness was over there making a film, and Alec Guinness said, "Don't go." Because Alec Guinness right. said that he had this feeling. Yeah. He said, don't go. He came out, he, he actually went up in the car and said, do you fancy coming down? And he went, no. Wow. And he, he pleaded with him not to go. Alec Guinness actually yeah. said that in an interview. Yeah. Scene. So, you know, it, it says it's fascinating stuff, what, what you've got here. And also, Nick Drake. Oh, absolutely. No, I mean, there's a character. Well, there's a... Uh, uh, now, I know that you were going to talk about him, and Ed Gilchrist, who actually rooms with him, he, he, you know, he's on my show, oh, wow. uh, he rooms with him at Cambridge. Yeah. So he was a very good friend of uh, Nick Drake's, and oh, he, right. he, he, he was only yeah, young, wasn't he, really? And lots of people, lots of people didn't know him, yet more people yeah. did know uh, Nick Drake. Yeah, well, one of the things about him, apparently he was very shy and introspective, and he absolutely hated uh, touring and uh, live performance. Yeah. Uh, he did manage to make three albums before he died. Yeah. Then he had a sort of nervous breakdown in the early 70s, yeah. and he went back to live with his parents. Yeah. And he, he died of an overdose, actually, uh, antidepressants. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but at the time, it wasn't considered that... Um, uh, it was suicide, but I read this wonderful quote from his sister, um, saying that uh, she, she hoped it was suicide because she felt it it was better if he'd chosen, uh, you know, to shuffle off this mortal coil rather than the whole thing just to have been an accident. And I thought that was quite a an interesting sentiment. It is an interesting sentiment because I would have rather have had a, an accidental uh, overdose because. You know, if you're going to uh, take your own life, I think first and foremost, you've got to be brave. Not only that, uh, you must have a mental issue as well. Uh, yeah. But if it was accidental, you know, and you are taking uh, medication, the likes of antidepressants, you know, it's just one of those unfortunate things. That's right. That's the way I see it anyway. But Nick yeah. Drake was a great singer, wasn't he? Oh, and it's isn't it strange? Thing. Can you tell us more about why? Was it his nerves or was he that shy, you know, to go on stage because he was a great singer? Even that Gilchrist said he, he had a great voice. Yeah, I, I, I think he, 
he, he was just one of these guys that's, um, I mean, he had a fabulous voice, but it, he, he just found it really, really difficult to uh, perform in front of uh, other people. And he, he did actually decide to uh, pack it all up uh, the, in the, uh, the record uh, business. And I think he even had a, uh, one interview to go into the army, but that's, uh, that came to, uh, to nothing. Yeah. And then he decided to get back into uh, music just before he died. He did cut uh, four tracks, apparently, yeah. Yeah. Uh, just before he died, sort of late 1973. Yeah. It's so sad, though, isn't it, when you're there at these deaths? You know, we, yeah. we mentioned Jimmy Dean and the likes of Stuart Sutcliffe that we were talking about. But yeah. what about Alan Freed as well? Now, you know, he, he, he was a sort of... Can you gen us up more about that? Because he, he fell from grace, didn't he, through the payola uh, sort of scandal? Oh, very, very much. I mean, he's the guy who coined the expression uh, rock and roll. Oh, right, OK. And in the very early 50s, he started his um, radio show. I forget the... Uh, the uh, radio station now in Cleveland, which is why the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame's in Cleveland. That's considered to be the sort of birthplace of uh, rock and roll. And he used to play black R and B artists records, and he was calling them uh, rock and roll. And then he was the first uh, promoter of a uh, well, he promoted the first ever uh, rock and roll concert, and that ended, as you'd hope, in uh, complete disarray. Uh, it was completely sold out. Literally a thousand people tried to gate crash it, and the whole thing was um, was closed down. But what happened was that uh, he became very famous. I mean, he, he had his radio shows, he had television shows. He was actually in movies as himself uh, as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. I've actually seen him in the old black and white rock and roll uh, uh, thing scenarios where That's he right. made a guest appearance, didn't he? Really? Yeah, absolutely. But I think then, I, I think I seen him in well I, I don't know I think it was Dion he was on stage or oh, was it oh, I tell you who it was it was um, Little Richard Oh Little yeah Richard was uh, banging away there on the piano and a guiltless yeah. sense of uh, you know the fellow who who, who uh, rooms with Nick Drake and yeah. he said um, Nick hates to perform and, but he performed yeah. for me and my mates in, uh, in our rooms, you know, live, obviously. So, yeah. isn't it? And he said, John Martin and Danny Thompson became his friends. John dedicated solid air to Nick. Yeah. You know, so it, it's great to uh, think that, you know, he's never forgotten. And it must have been devastating for the likes of Ed Gilchrist and, you know, oh, yeah. everybody else who, who, who was great uh, fans of his. You know, yeah. unfortunately, age 30. And, um, you know, dying like that, uh, you know, I think it was accidental myself. I wouldn't like to say that he, uh, you know, committed suicide. What about Jeff no, I, I, I'd have thought it was accidental as well, to be honest. That's so good, that, that. I'm that glad you think that. Thing. I'm glad you think that, to be honest. Um, you know, Derek, what about this uh, Jeff, Jeff Buckley? Well, I mean, he's uh, an interesting character. He's the son of uh, Tim Buckley. Yeah. Famous sort of uh, folk uh, folk singer. He's another one of these guys that um, you know died. Well, he, he died in quite strange circumstances. He was about thirty years old. Yeah, and uh, uh, he was with uh, one of the, they were they were recording uh, an album at the time, and they must have been having a bit of downtime. And they were listening to the radio on the banks of um, a river in uh, in Memphis, and apparently he waded in fully clothed. Uh, with uh, apparently had quite heavy boots on, mm. and he, he sort of turned onto his back and floated, uh, and this uh, boat uh, came past and created uh, quite a, a swell, and the guy that was still on the bank, uh, he thought that they were listening to the radio, and I think there was a guitar there as well, and he was a bit concerned that the radio might get ruined, so he turned around, turned away, moved the radio out of the oncoming water, um, and when he turned back, uh, Jeff Buckley was uh, nowhere to be seen. And it oh. was three or four days before they actually found his uh, his body. And the theory is that he must have been dragged underwater because he was fully clothed. I don't know if you've ever swum, but yeah. I can remember back in my school days yeah. doing the uh, life-saving awards. You had to swim a length, uh, you had to keep baths in your 
uh, clothes, and it makes a heck of a difference. Yeah. And he was pulled under water and some miles down uh, stream before they found him. Oh, and that's so, that's a, such a shame. Like Kirsty McCall, isn't it? Really? Yeah, absolutely. And that's such a shame. Nick, um, Ed Gilchrist said something. He said uh, he said about Nick Drake, accidental in my opinion, and prescription absolutely. drugs. You know, so three of us. Uh, yeah. said that it was accidental rather than him taking his own life, which is yeah. such a shame, really. You know, what about Jim Crotchet as well? Or Cross, you know, Crotchet, his name is. Yeah, I mean, he's another one of these guys that's um, uh, really, he, he died in his prime. He was just sort of uh, breaking through with songs like Bad, uh, Bad Leroy Brown. Right. Uh, and he died in a, a plane crash. Yeah. And you know he he, he also had a, a, a well big hit shortly after that with uh, I have to say uh, I love you in a song which is a fabulous uh, yeah. track. Yeah, yeah, it's that, sad, I mean, isn't all, it? But when you go over to when you go over, which is you know, in my opinion, it, it, it's just nuts, and it's um, the the non it, shall we say, of both. Eddie Cochran and Buddy Ali. Buddy Ali, after their death, yet he was hit here in the UK, yet down in America. Can you give it, fill us in more? Because I thought Eddie Cochran, you know, was absolutely brilliant, and so was obviously Buddy Ali, and that's the Beatles. You know, he, he, he greatly had, uh, inspired the Beatles besides Elvis. So can you give us a bit more on uh, Cochran and Buddy Ali? Yeah, I think Eddie Cochran's a really good example of someone that now is just a household name from the sort of world of uh, the late 50s uh, rock and roll. But if you know, he ever had three hits um, in America, and they were only number 18, number 8, and number 35, sitting in a balcony, summertime blues, and come on, everybody. One was in 57, one was in 58, and one was in 59. And after he died, he had no more. Uh, hits in America, but his, his record label Liberty, I mean, they carried on issuing singles uh, up until 1962. I mean, he died in uh, 1960. But in the UK, and this is another interesting thing that comes across these uh, people when you sort of start analysing them, um, is that in the UK, and he had four hits before he died here, but in the UK he had eight hits um, after he died. And that's the same with... Um, Elvis. Elvis had, uh, well, I mean, he, he had 100 hits in the UK and 71 after he died. But in America, Elvis had 112 um, hits when he was alive and only two uh, chart appearances um, after he died. That's incredible. Right, Absolutely amazing. Hi, Derek. Mark here. I'm just looking at that. I was talking to Frank before about that. And the Buddy Holly one stands out for me. Yeah. Um, over, over here... After he died, he had 19 hits. Absolutely. And yet, and yet over in the United States, where you think he'd be more more popular, he had none. Now, is, right. is there any particular reason for that? I, I really don't know, to be honest. Um, but it, it's not just the American artists that are more successful over here. Uh, I mean, if you look at um, John Lennon, uh, he had 12 hits before he died over here and 17 uh, up until 2008. Um, over here after he died. In America, he had 10 before he died. And he only had three hits um, after he died, with the last one being in 1984. So it seems that the American audiences sort of move on um, a lot faster than the uh, British audiences. You had the British counterparts. You wouldn't think that, though, would you? you know, because, no, you especially with Elvis. Because Elvis, king of rock and roll. The king of rock and roll yet, you know, it, it's phenomenal to think that they just, like, stayed away from the, the church. But as you said, you know, people do move on. And the Americans yeah. more or less, you know, you know, just say, well, okay, he's gone. Now, do you know what, one, one sad thing about when, when you look at all these artists and you see how young they all yeah, were when they, they died, were, yeah. can you, yeah. you know, it, it makes you think the music that we've lost that we'll never hear. Because yeah. they were taken at such a young age, and there's such such a variety. Because um, you, you have the likes of uh, Amy Winehouse, and you know she had a phenomenal voice, didn't she? And oh, she, yeah. she, you know, 
just imagine what she could have given today. Yeah. Absolutely amazing, you know. So it's that sort of scenario where you lose somebody and, you know, it's something's lost. Like Lennon, something was yeah. lost. They could have been... Do you believe, Derek, uh, that the Beatles would have got together if Lennon would have lived? It, it's very hard to say because um, I'd like to think they would. Uh, but if you imagine, I mean, they, they stopped uh, touring around the time of uh, Revolver. Um, so they, they've never played most, most of their um, own material. Because, I mean, Rubber Soul was the first album with all their material. And by the time Revolver came out, they'd stopped uh, touring. So they'd never actually played, um, you know, the, the bulk of the uh, classic uh, Pub 67 stuff, well, 66, mm. uh, uh, together live. So it, 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 I think it's a really difficult one. I think they would have liked to have because they all actually played together in different combinations after they uh, they split up. I mean, even John Lennon and Paul McCartney played together, and that's been captured on a on a bootleg, uh, a tooth of snore in 74. Yeah. So 74 was about when John Lennon... Uh, sort of became famously became a house husband. He had his lost That's weekend, right. yeah. um, uh, performed with um, Elton John. Had his only uh, US number one with his duet with um, Elton John. Helped him make it through the night. He never had it in a number one in the UK mm. in his lifetime. Mm. I mean, it's, it's quite a fascinating story, really. I mean, but just like starting over, you played. I mean, that that entered the charts about a month before he died. Because he just picked up his career again. He just re released a new album. So, I mean, that really was a tragedy. Well, I, I, was, in, uh, I was in London at the time, and I was in this art uh, place. Uh, that shows you. <laughs> it doesn't you know how I was. Anyway, that's when he had long hair and a beard and everything else. And the point is, I'm making, is that while I was in there, this art, art place, I... I this, all of a sudden, this song came on. And I said, that's John Lennon. And no one has heard from him for about five years. Because he yeah, just right. went like into hibernation, didn't he? As you said. Absolutely. A, 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 you know, a house husband. And people were then were straining, you know, straining the, the ears. Saying, oh, wow, look at this. You know, listen to this. It is, it's yeah. Lennon, it's Lennon. And bang, you know, it was him. Because yeah. the radio said, uh, that's John Lennon. Uh, and we were all absolutely delighted because, you know, when he mentions it's off the album, Double Fantasy, wow, you know, he's got an album out. Everyone was absolutely delighted and banged the next yeah. performance he's got. Yeah. Right, taken but, up. Listen, uh, do you know when the Beatles went over to see Elvis? I, I, I said yeah. to uh, Mark before, I'll ask Derek this. Do you know when the Beatles went over to see Elvis? Now, they did a jamming session. Was that ever recorded or wasn't it recorded? I'm pretty sure it wasn't recorded. I'm not sure it was even as formal as a jam. I think um, Paul McCartney and uh, uh, Elvis sort of messed around. Elvis was playing bass guitar. Uh, but apparently the whole thing was a very, uh, very low-key uh, affair. They were mostly just chatting, I think. But I'm pretty sure that nothing was ever recorded. Oh, okay. I've never seen anything come of it uh, as a recording. Yeah, just imagine though, if they would have been oh. jamming and wow. it would have been recorded, that would have been phenomenal, wouldn't it? Really? Oh, it would have been. Because I mean, John, John Lennon. Interestingly enough, um, he said of um, Elvis uh, that uh, Elvis died the day he went in the army. <laughs> I remember him saying that. You know, I yeah. remember Elvis saying that. I mean, uh, John Lennon, because they interviewed, uh, I remember them interviewing Tom Jones as well. And yeah. he went like that. He said, uh, oh, he was fat. He got, he <laughs> put on too much weight. He was fat. And I said, said to myself, what's he going on about? Yeah. He, all he was going on was about his weight. And there's uh, Lennon saying, yeah, he died when he went into the army. You know, so it's a big difference between Tom Jones and, you know, the quote by Lennon, isn't it? Absolutely, yeah. How long did he actually go in the army for? Uh, uh, about 18 years. months, I think, just under a couple of years. Was it? Yeah. About and 18 I, months, I think. I remember, honestly, I was a kid, I was a little kid, and I was watching the telly. 
and he was having his hair shown, right off. Yeah. And there was girls who were older than me, you know, friends of the family. I was in their house, you know, watching the telly. I was only a kid. I was being uh, minded. And I was only uh, 18 at the time. No, I wasn't. I was only a child being minded, you know, babysat by these big girls, sisters they were. And I always remember them getting his ear shot. It was on the news. And the girls were screaming, you know, because he yeah. was getting his ear shot. You know, getting it shaved off. That was it. Was he? Was he based in America all the time, or was he? No, he went to Germany most of the time. Did he? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he sang a song I'll in there. the camp. It must have been surrounded by <laughs> teenage <laughs> girls, wasn't it? <laughs> well, the uh, Elvis was was well, in there. But uh, do you know what though? It's a good point that Mark, because you might know. I don't know, Derek. I hope you do. Do you know when he was in the army there? I never ever heard. Anybody, you know, like former soldiers who served with him, speak yeah. about Elvis. I never heard anyone say, "Oh yeah, I was in there." You know, I was in the camp with him, and uh, he was a great guy. You know, no never heard anything out. like that. Did you like my uh, accent there? To, to it's perfect, him? absolutely perfect, mate. Good job you said that because you you <laughs> just said, "Oh, that's nice. Thanks for coming on the show, and you know, <laughs> we'll see you sometime in the future or whatever." No, but. To, did you hear any stories or anything like that from, you know, fellas no, you, you who actually served with them? You don't get uh, much of the way stories coming out from, from the Army days. I mean, he did a couple of, well, certainly one recording session uh, while he was technically in the Army. Uh, but very much he, 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 he took a, a sidestep away from the whole thing while he was in the Army. I think he just wanted to be another... Uh, G.I. Joe, basically. I mean, he made he made Sergeant, but that's when he met Priscilla, of course. She was the daughter, the 14-year-old daughter of, it was either Camp Commandant or one of the one of the uh, senior officers there. Right. I think he was a colonel. Yeah, I think you're right. Do you know, I, I tell you what, what you just said there, and with today's climate, that wouldn't oh, yeah. be acceptable today, would it? Absolutely not. I mean, you look so different then. I mean, Jerry Lee Lewis married his cousin's 14-year-old's uh, yeah. daughter. Yeah. That's that's crazy, isn't it? You know, with today's climate the way it is, there's no way that would have been allowed on the planet, you know, yeah. even to think about it. But, you yeah. know, having said that, uh, I was talking to Mark again before, and I said, I'll, I'll ask Derek. Now, I said to Mark, Elvis, all right, he kicked off then. Uh, all of a sudden, everybody loved Elvis, you know, this this young fella. And uh, the next, uh, the likes of Chuck Berry came along. And, you know, these other people, uh, you know, Fats Domino, and they started to rise. Uh, and do you think that, you know, coming into the 60s, you know, late 50s, all of a sudden, you had uh, these like four lads from Liverpool. They started to emerge, and yet they took over. And all of a sudden, you had the sixties, where it was just Beatles and other bands like the Stones and everybody else that was coming along. The Searchers, for example, you know they were taking over, especially the Beatles. Though then Elvis was like submerged and lost in transit. transit. Do you agree with that? Oh, very much. I mean, if, if you look at the sort of history at that time, it's, it's really interesting. American rock and roll was pretty much over by uh, the time Elvis went in the army. Little Richard had found God, and he'd renounced rock and roll. Jelly Lewis, uh, his rock and roll audience, left him in droves when he uh, married his 14-year-old cousin. Oh, his cousin's daughter, technically. Um... And Buddy Holly was killed in a plane crash. Of course, Elvis went in the army. And when Elvis came out of the army, he didn't try to become a rock and roll star again. Um, he uh, became a, a matinee idol and produced about uh, 31 movies across the uh, the 60s. But what happened in America, in, in the UK, was that the British rock and roll, uh, that morphed into beat music very much. I mean, the, the Mersey beats. Uh, groups were very much at the uh, the forefront in the early and middle 60s. And then when you get to 64, you get what they call the uh, the British Invasion, which is basically when the Beatles cracked America on the uh, Ed Sullivan show. But for the next two years, 
The American uh, bands couldn't get a, a look in. People like the birds even call themselves the beef eaters to try and sound more British to get airplay on American uh, radio. Wow. And then by about 66, that had run its course. And that's really that was very much the birth of uh, rock music, 66, with people like Cream, yeah. uh, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah. Um, but it, it, it was very much um, an end of an era, um, rock and roll wise, um, at the end of the uh, 50s. American music wasn't really going anywhere. It fragmented into uh, people like, um, well, surf music was one of them. Uh, but you had dance crazes with Chubby Checker. Uh, rock and roll became very clear, uh, clear, uh, clean cut with uh, young teen idols. Yeah, yeah. It's strange that, isn't it? Because, you yeah. know, you were mentioning before about the Beatles and, uh, you know, where, you know, the last performance in live and everything else. Yeah, one of the greatest performances. And I said, that's, that is the Beatles it was the live performance on the roof. Get back oh, and yeah. all that. That was yeah. absolutely phenomenal. Freezing cold yeah. weather. And yeah. that's how good they were. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there, there, there's nobody in the in the same league as uh, as the Beatles. In fact, you know, the, the only two people I would put it in the Premier of Premier Leagues would be uh, the Beatles and uh, Elvis Presley. Yeah. I think everybody else comes into other leagues. I think. I mean, they are timeless. I mean, if you look at Elvis, it was uncool to like Elvis in the '60s. Yeah. Uncool to like Elvis in the '70s. Yeah. Yeah. And if you look at his wealth when he died. He left about $4.9 million, which is about $20 million today, apparently. Yeah. Uh, but in 2017, his, uh, his uh, estates uh, valued $300 million. Wow. Wow. It just shows you as well uh, how, how, uh, how generous Elvis was. Oh, yeah. He was a very generous man because he used to just pull up in cars, you know, with his cars. I'll stop here and see somebody and give him a ring yeah. or give him something, you know, money or whatever. Like our Jews, you know, our Jews was uh, more or less the same. I think Elvis was a, a philanthropist in his own little way. Well, he, he, he famously um, they pulled guys off the street and gave them, a, took them into the local Cadillac showroom and gave them a Cadillac. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I mean. Yeah. So that's people would hang around outside the uh, catalogue place hoping Elvis would walk by. Did you ever see the film? I know. And did you ever see the film, imagine? And there was a lad from Sweden or Norway and he was outside and he said, oh, he's a stalker, this fella. And yet Lennon brought him in and gave him breakfast and George Harrison was there. Right. I thought that was absolutely fantastic. So, so didn't you ever see that at all, no? No, I haven't seen that one. Really? You know, did you ever see it, Mark? No, no. no. Was it. Did you see it, Jason? No one's seen it, only me. I wonder if I dreamt it. <laughs> no, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Does it exist? <laughs> definitely <laughs> never dreamt it. Does it exist? Yeah, it's like a UFO. <laughs> no, but the thing is, the thing is, I'll tell you, it was when uh, Harrison was really having a go. It's on film. It's, I'm sure it's on Imagine. And yeah. uh, George Harrison's having a go about Paul McCartney. And he, I think it was, you know, some song he sang, you know, that got a hit. And he said, oh, he's a big hit now in Sweden or Norway or somewhere like Mop. Yeah. He was calling a Mophead. Right. He was calling a Mophead. And, uh, you know, it's really having a go at him. But, but, having said that, you don't remember that bringing in this fella and giving him a breakfast and everything else, and he just said, I just want to meet uh, the Beatles. Yeah. And that was in the, you know, the, the, the 70s, around 72, 73, or something like that. Yeah. Who do you reckon was a, a great Beatle? And yet, you know, who would you say was the best Beatle anyway? Well, I, I, I think it's an interesting one there. Um, John Lennon certainly seems to be the face of the Beatles now. But if you look back, um, it was Paul McCartney who had the idea for Sgt. Pepper. And it was McCartney's idea for Magical Mystery Tour and the sort of Get Back project that became uh, Let It Be. Um, so I, I, I think, you know, I, I, views change as, uh, as time goes on, as it were. Yeah. 
But I, mm. I mean, I, I would. I'm, I must say, I I used to um, have John Lennon. I think is my favourite uh, Beatle. But when I was researching the uh, the book, because I was delving more and more into the detail of it, uh, I didn't realise just how um, how much Paul McCartney was behind an awful lot of um, what was going on. So you know, he he certainly uh, rose a lot in my estimation of the the whole thing. And Ringo as well, I think. It, is you often see him now referenced uh, some to some you know really good drumming on uh, some of the tracks. Yeah. He's had a very mixed press from a drumming point of view, yeah. uh, but yeah. he, that seems to be getting stronger now as well because he's a great character. I was well, always I was always drawn to John Lennon personally, mm-hmm. but then I listen to George Harrison's uh, album Thirty Three and a Third. Mm-hmm. And I, don't, I don't know whether you've ever heard it. Yeah. But it, it, it sort of showed me him in a whole new light because yeah. I, I, I didn't give him enough, enough credit. Yeah. I don't Absolutely think anybody did. I don't think anybody did. Because there was uh, much more, more to him. Yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So absolutely. And one of the, the song Something, I think, is, am I right in saying this, Derek? The song Something, which he wrote, has, has been sung by more artists than any other Beatles song. I, I think the only one ahead of it is uh, yesterday. Oh, yesterday! Yeah. I think yesterday is the biggest. I think that's the second biggest okay. sort of Beatles okay. uh, song that's ever been covered. Both iconic songs, though. Oh, they? both, both yeah, as Mark said there, both iconic songs. It's absolutely amazing, you know, to think about what these four lads achieved, mm. which was phenomenal. But Mark mm. Kinnish uh, actually said he, he, he sent through a message. Uh, wait till I get it. Hang on a minute. Right. Mark Kinnish said, um, he said, Frank, uh, the other sad thing was John Lennon was going to do a big tour the year after ni- in 1981. Sadly, it never happened, of course. Yeah, yeah. So he said that he was going to do a big tour. I'm sure. Andy Peebles gave the last interview, didn't he? That's right. Yeah. And, I think that was only days before, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And he couldn't believe it, could he? I remember him being interviewed yep. on the day as well. Our kid phoned me up. As, as I said, I was down in London. And uh, he phoned me up. And it was after I was told, to be honest, uh, because someone woke me up. And here's exactly what I said. Here's exactly what I said. Someone woke me up. And I went, oh, you know, as you do, this is at 7.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock or 7.30 in the morning. And uh, said, John Lennon's dead. And I went, what? He said, he's dead. Dead? I said, he, he must have gone out with a bang. That's exactly what I said. <laughs> I didn't know anything about, you know, yeah. being uh, shot dead, unfortunately. But yeah. uh, when our kid phoned me up, he said, Francis, he said, um, it's, it's just like a mug. He said, people are wandering around, you know, in the days. He mm. said, it's, it's crazy. And it was a shock, know. wasn't it? I mean, yeah, he was putting, uh, now don't forget, I was down there and he, he was putting, uh, the, uh, he said everyone was going down with flowers and the candles and everything else to say George is all yeah. plateau. So it was a shock to the uh, Liverpool system. Yeah, I imagine. But it was, he, he was uh, recording with uh, Yoko Ono that afternoon, working on a song that uh, Yoko was planning as a, a single. So, you know, he was in the studio right up until hours before his death. Yeah. So sad, you know. And the music, you know, we can always turn around and say, uh, you know, we lost a lot of um, music with other artists and, and whatever. But he was a singer-songwriter. And the, we did lose a hell of a lot of music through it. Yeah. I mean, I think that was one of George's problems, really. He was in, he was competing with two of the greatest, arguably, you know, the two greatest uh, songwriters of the 20th uh, century. And I, I did read somewhere that um, uh, he, he, he wrote an awful lot of stuff while he was with the Beatles, and he put it all, most of it, onto his first album. And I've often seen people comment that he'd have been smarter to have uh, kept some of those songs back for a few more uh, albums. Because he was a great songwriter, George. Yeah, 
Absolutely. Derek, it's been absolutely phenomenal because what we're going to do, we're going to play an Eddie Cochran song. Oh, brilliant. So we'll come right back to you after this, okay? And okay. It's, uh, come on, everybody. You want to hear me singing as uh, Derek? You, you know, you go, you are Eddie Cochran. No, <laughs> you won't. Like, <laughs> there he is. No, you don't hear me sing, mate. <laughs> Listen to Mersey Radio wherever you are on air, online, and on your phone. www.merseyradio.co.uk. Oh, Derek, uh, it's been absolutely wonderful. No, I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you so much. Will you be back on next month? Oh, yeah, yes, please. I'd love to. Great, because, uh, you know, you just come up with what you want to say and uh, send uh, send uh, Jason through what we're going to talk about on the next one. And don't forget to all the listeners out there, Derek has a most fantastic book out, and it's called Rock and Roll Unraveled. And you can actually get it on uh, or go to his website, but you can if you want to... Uh, go right through to it. Go www.rockandrollunravel.com. That's all one word. www.rockandrollunravel.com. And if you want to do the Facebook, it's Rock and Roll Unraveled again. And Twitter, at RNR Unraveled. That's Twitter, at RNR Unraveled. Absolutely brilliant. Once again, Derek, thank you so much, and we'll speak to you next month. Okay, one very quick one on Eddie Cochran. Go on. Uh, the policeman who attended the uh, the crash that killed him was a guy called Dave Harmon, changed his name to Dave D, and joined up with his little mate, uh, Dozy Beaky Mick and Titch. Isn't that incredible? Go away. And he died here, did he, yeah? Oh, Eddie Cochran, yeah, he, he died at the end of a British tour. I mean, he was going. He was going back to the airport. He'd been on a oh, couple of month tour with Gene Vincent. Yeah. Finished up in Bristol, and they were driving back to Heathrow because he wanted to get back to uh, to America. And he crashed sort of Chichester way. Well, listen, talk about that as well next. You know, next time. But you know, in more detail. Not only that. You know, come up with an, another team for us. How about that? Okay, excellent. Oh, thanks a lot, Derek. We've got to go and leave it now. Thank you so much. Oh, cheers, Derek. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. The best in 60s and 70s music, plus a little bit of history. Tune into Frank Carlisle every Monday at 8pm here only on Mersey Radio.